Good evening. Welcome to Bible study at the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church, located in the great city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, 1217 Murkison Road. Good evening. I want to thank you for tuning in this evening and allowing me to be your Bible teacher. I take great joy in being able to share God's word with you every week. For those of you who have been tuning in since March, thank you so much for allowing me to educate you in the word of God and for allowing us both to grow spiritually in God's word. Tonight we're going to begin our Bible study, first of all, in prayer. Let us go to God this evening. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. We thank you so much for allowing us to assemble over this virtual Bible study. Bless us now as we enter into your word. Allow us to hear your truth. Help us to understand, God, where you are. Help us to understand that life really does matter because you have granted it unto us. You came that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Help us to enjoy and walk in the calling over our lives. Bless everyone who is listening this evening. Touch them, Lord, wherever they need to be touched. Help them, Lord, wherever they need to be helped. Bless them, Lord, wherever they need to be blessed. Thank you for being such an awesome and wonderful God. We thank you this evening. In Jesus' name, we all say together, amen. This evening, we are beginning a new Bible study entitled Kingdom Lives Matter. I would encourage you now to go to the Mount Sinai Fayetteville dot com website click on bible study you will see the title kingdom lives matter and click on lesson number one that will be the lesson for us this evening you can either print that out download it or just watch it or watch from your computer uh, it doesn't matter as long as you have access and this evening if you don't mind text someone and Call someone and let them know we're having Bible study. Would you join me? Would you connect with me in Bible study this evening? Would you, would you do that and let us uh, go beyond the walls and connect with others? So as we begin, I have my Bible. I'm ready. I have my, I have my lesson, and I hope that you have your Bible, whether you're looking at it, uh, a, a physical Bible or on your tablet or on your phone or computer. As long as you have the word of God, we are ready to go. And this evening, I am using the New American Standard Version of the Scriptures. Tonight, we begin a Bible study entitled Kingdom Lives Matter. I want to talk about uh, lives mattering from a kingdom perspective, from a God perspective. I, I want us to understand what that means as we look at scripture. And I realize that uh, there is a movement that is entitled Black Lives Matter. There's a lot of controversy going back and forth about that movement, but from a Christian perspective, we are a Christian church. We believe in, we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe in his word. So we have to look at things from a kingdom perspective and what the word of God has to say about that. So tonight's lesson is lesson one and is it, it is entitled Amago Dei. Amago Dei is the, is the Hebrew language, which means in the image of God. In the image of God. And I want you to incorporate the, the phrase Amago Dei in your vocabulary. Simply again, meaning in the image of of God. That's what we want to, to study. With the objective in mind that uh, all persons are made in God's image. We want to understand what that means from an everyday perspective. How we should live out our lives in the image of God. Our scriptural reference this evening is found in the book of Genesis, uh, the very first chapter of Genesis, verse 26 and 27. These are key verses in scripture. 
So if you have your Bibles again, turn with me there to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And also we'll turn over to Genesis chapter 5 and also read verse number 1. The 26th verse of chapter 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Turn over to Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. And it reads uh, somewhat similarly. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. So this starts the descendancy of Adam. In the day when God created man, you see that term used again, created. He made him in the likeness of God. Verse 2 says he created them male and female. He blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. Verse 3 says when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. So now what do we initially begin to see here? That the scripture let, scriptures let us know that man, you and I, humanity, is made in God's image. And as a result of being made in God's image, Adam has a son by the name of Seth, and he is made in his father's likeness according to his father's image. So as we as we travel through, down through history, beginning with Adam, every man is made in the image of God and according to God's likeness. So we want to understand why that is so important for us to, to, to have in our minds, to have in our spirits, that I am a person created by God and made in God's likeness. That is so important to understand who you are. So many people are wandering around and they're not even sure of who they are. Tonight, we begin to clarify that. We begin to give understanding that I am Aaron Jamel Johnson. You are, say your name. You are made in God's image and according to God's likeness. That is who you are. So, if someone asks you, who are you? And you say, I am somebody who's made in God's image. God made me. That's who I am. Yeah, you could say, my parents are, I'm from this place, but the full scope of, of this understanding is to know that I am who I am because I'm made according to God's image. That ought to help everyone's esteem, it ought to raise your level of self-esteem and awareness of who you are. I'm not a failure. I'm not a put down. I'm nobody's fool. I am a person who's made according to God's image and likeness. Now, turn over your Bibles to Romans, the eighth chapter we began to shape that understanding by looking at who Christ is. Romans chapter 8, 
verse 28. As, a, as someone who is made in God's image, I need to know what that looks like. I need to know how to begin to process that in my spirit and really discern if I'm made in God's image, is that thought too lofty for me to try to understand? So the way that God put in place for us to understand it is to look at who Christ is. Now, this is a, a forthcoming lesson where we will further investigate who Christ is and how we are to conform to his image. Read with me in Romans, the eighth chapter, in verse 28. It says, well, I'm sorry, verse 29, verse 29. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of God or his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. For those whom he foreknew, God, who he knew already in his mind, he predestined, or rather, he predetermined that we would conform to God's Son, Jesus Christ. If we need to understand who we look like, we are to look like Jesus. Because Jesus and the Father are one. That is what John 10 and 31 says. I and the Father are one. So when the Godhead got together, they made a determination that if this man that we are creating, he needs to have a good image of what he should look like. And that image is based upon the Son. All right? That gives us a foundational perspective of how we should look at our own lives. So if my life matters, it matters because I am made in the image of God. Let me say that one more time. Let me repeat that. If my life matters, and it does, the reason it matters is because, not, not because of the color of my skin, but it matters because I am made in the image of God. I, I'm not made in the image of skin color. I'm made in the image of God. Well, who is God? Well, when we go back to Genesis and go back to the very first chapter, in verse number 1, of chapter 1 of the book of Genesis, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God, in the very first verse of the Bible, is the word, the Hebrew name, Elohim, for God. Now, God has many names. And the reason why God has many names is so that we can understand who he is. Remember, God is so vast and so enormous because he is he is before the heavens and the earth he's before the heavens and the earth and he's after the heavens and the earth so how can we begin to understand who God is when God existed before there was a heavens and an earth and he existed after a heavens and an earth that's why he is God. So how do we begin to understand who God is? We understand him as Elohim, creator. So when we read in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, we understand that God is a maker of man. Without God, there would be no you and I. So you, you, can, you can be thankful for your mother and your father. Hallelujah. We're grateful for our parents. But then your grandparents. Hallelujah, happy. Thank you for them. But then their parents. 
And it's, it, this comes all the way back. When you trace family line and lineage, you go through your whole family, however that, 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 that family lineage is, however long that is, we, don't, we could never trace it all the way back to Adam. But this is where we come back to. This is the genesis, the beginning. And if I'm to understand how I should function in life, I learn from Genesis. I function as a created being in God's image. Now, why even have this discussion of the Imago Dei? Why even bring this up, Pastor? Why even indulge in such a conversation? Well, number one, in our country, we have been experiencing the death of black men in America. It is not anything new for us to experience the death of black men in America. It's been going as far as we can know, uh, back to even go to take it back to Emmett Till. He, his life uh, uh, let us know that black men were being killed and lynched. My father tells a story of when he, in his childhood, when he was born in 1933, in his community of Willard, North Carolina, how there was a lynching. So in America, as recent as May the 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a black American man, was killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the knee of a white officer. And as that white officer's knee was on George Floyd's neck, we all heard it. We all saw the video. He said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. That moment sparked an outburst of protest in America, spearheaded primarily by the movement Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter came into being in 2013 uh, with the death of Trayvon Martin in response to the acquittal of the officer, or rather um, 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 the man that, um, that killed him. There, there became a, a movement, Zimmerman, I had a blank right there for a moment, Black Lives Matter came into being a global movement. And on their, on their website, Black Lives Matter website, it says to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted in black communities by state and vigilantes. That's what their website stands for, says what, why they came into existence. Well, as I understand Black Lives Matter, I understand that it is a political activist movement that has an agenda that is on their website. And one aspect of their agenda, one point in their agenda, it says to defund the police. Well, that is a political uh, movement. That is a political agenda that Black Lives Matter has taken on to try to get done in response to a George Floyd being killed. This is what Black Lives Matter says. This is something that should be done to bring justice within America to bring justice to lives that are that have been killed is to 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 defund the police who are not standing up for black lives. 
That's also on their website. That's one way to look at Black Lives Matter. Another way to look at Black Lives Matter for black people is to look at it from a cultural and historical perspective. Black Lives Matter is a cultural awareness and a historical awareness that black men and black lives have been taken for granted throughout history. May the 25th did not just start, or 2013 at the death of Trayvon Martin. That did not just start then. Uh, LeBron James had a statement in an interview a couple of weeks ago as they are now down in Disney World, what they call the bubble. He, he made a statement. He says, Black Lives Matter is not a movement for black people because we live out black life mattering every day. And I thought about that statement, and I said, that makes a lot of sense. It, the movement, the movement of it is, is, is one thing, but living the life is another thing. And so as, as a black man, myself, in America, I think about and Emmett Till being murdered. I, I think about when I go into stores, uh, am I going to be racially profiled? As an officer sees me, as one saw me driving down the road yesterday, would he pull me over just because I'm a black male riding? So, so we live this out. When, you, when a black male or a black person works in a, a white environment primarily, how are those white counterparts going to look at the black person working alongside them? Well, we've always been taught as a people that you need to be one, two, or three steps ahead of your white counterparts. But they not only said that from a white counterpart, they also said that if you're going to be the best, just be the best. Put your best foot forward and strive to be all that God created you to be. Now, that's what I heard in my, in my environment among my family, among my church family that I grew up in. That was what they stressed. You not only be the best in, in when you're among uh, uh, people who are not in, among your skin color, but be the best among your peers, period. So Black Lives Matter has a cultural and historical awareness because we understand black life does matter. But also, black life mattering matters from a unifying perspective. When I say unifying perspective, I mean when we historically look back at civil rights, Black people have been unifying uh, and bringing people together. We, we fought for integration. We fought to, to have our life beside a white person's life or an Asian person's life. Dr. Martin Luther King stressed in his dream for America that it was important that that blacks and, and, and white life be able to interact. And so we've had a huge civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s that pushed for black people having integrated lives with white people. And as a result of that, we, 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 we became an integrated society, but that didn't just help black people, that help white people as well. So black life mattering has, for black people, has been a unifying, a unifying uh, aspect of who we are. We bring people together. So I think that when you think about Black Lives Matter, 
you can't just look at it from the political angle. It's much more than the political angle. There is the historical cultural awareness. And then it, it's a unifying. And even the movement, Black Lives Matter, is trying to bring everybody together. When you look out on the streets and see that there are people from all, all walks of life who are walking and, and people who are wearing Black Lives Matter shirts. So it's raising the awareness that, hey, George Floyd's death should have never happened. Now, I, I said all that to say, I really want you and I to understand this concept of life mattering, not so much from skin color, but I want us to understand it from a biblical perspective. Because all, 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 of, all of us have rights. We have human rights. There are certain rights and norms or principles that govern our behavior, uh, how we act. Our human rights lets us know that we are free, we are equal. Everybody has just as much right as the next. We have labeled it in America as those who are wealthy, the high income, middle income, low income. We've created barriers in our own society. And we have communities that we call low-income communities. And there's a certain group of people that live in, that we've labeled, that live in low-income communities. Uneducated, poor, don't have a chance, violent, crime. We, that's how we label communities. So those are barriers. But here's where the point becomes interesting. Does the low-income community's life matter? Do, do their lives matter? Do we just push them to the side and create a certain type of housing that's just for them and, and put them over here? And then we say, oh, we have the middle class. Then we have the wealthy. But we can't live where the wealthy live. So we, we can't be, so we have a division and a divide. Well, do their lives matter more because they have more money than a low income? But we create prejudices and biases. You don't even have to be, you don't have to be, that's, that's, that's not even along racial lines. We do that even among black people. Create those divides and barriers. But everybody has the same human rights. You have a right to marry. Now, when you look at it from a Christian perspective, the scripture says that he created them male and female. So we understand right to marry from a biblical perspective that that is male and female. Well, we have a right to own things. You have a right to buy a car, right to buy a house. But even within that right, there are income gaps. And it has been it has been created and it is purposely designed that in in certain places you can't buy a house if you don't have the money. So that has created a divide to to drive out uh, a certain group of people in certain places that you can't live here because you you don't have the income. And then so as a result of not having the income, you create more, dis or more disparity, rather, is created. So we have the right to assemble. We have a right to assemble. Uh, and we should, I think, we should be assembling now here at Mount Sinai. COVID-19 tells us, no, you can't assemble. But we have the, uh, the right to assemble. And I think we should exercise our right with the proper health protocol procedures in place uh, because the body of Christ is meant to fellowship. We are meant to come together. The Bible talks about us assembling together. We have this right, and we have to be real careful not to allow the government to have too many dictates on the assembling of the Christian church. 
right to religion, right to believe what you want to believe about God. We just happen to believe that biblical Christian principles matter. All right? So the Constitution affirms man's right. The Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But that created equal goes back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where it says God created man. And man has rights that have been given to them in the Declaration of Independence. It says endowed by their creator. Well, who is the creator? Elohim, God. You have the right to pursue life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Liberty. Jesus said that you should be free. The son came to set you free, which means no slavery. You can't shackle a person. You can't hold a person down. And you have a right to pursue happiness. Those are our rights. That's afforded us. So in these rights, we can't have lawlessness, murder, stealing, when people are just doing what they want to do. That, that takes away from human rights. So when Black Lives Matter says defund the police, that's a political agenda that we may not agree to because that can in, in, entail lead to lawlessness. Well, we have to understand this once again from biblical perspective. Now, having put that in perspective, let's go back to, uh, the, to the scriptures in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and, and, and look at verse 26. And that informs us that man is made in the image of God. Therefore, people matter because all people are made in the image of God. That's, that becomes the theological and biblical basis of your human rights philosophy. Because you look at it, when you look at it, say all lives matter from a, from a perspective that uh, all have been created in God's image, where the poor are, they're created in God's image. The sick, they're created in God's image. The weak, they're created in God's image. The disenfranchised, they're created in God's image. The mentally disordered, they're created in God's image. The abused and the oppressed and the elderly, they're created in God's image. So when we look at what matters is life matters. If there is someone who is mentally disordered, has a mental disorder, we don't just stick them in a corner somewhere and say, your life doesn't matter. You get over there, you can't think, stay over there. Or the abuse. Well, you, 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 are, you, are, you, are, you are a woman that's battered. You stay over here in this shelter and, 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 and stay out of the way of people. That's not life, that's not liberty, and that's not the pursuit of happiness. All life matters, theologically and biblically. So the designer, the Imago Dei, God, created us with a, listen to this, a special design in mind. You were made by Elohim, remember, the God who was before the heavens and earth and the God who's after the heavens and the earth. David said he is from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Well, from this everlasting to that everlasting, that's a big place. And the person who's able to occupy that space is God. We, we are made in his likeness. We have, we're made with a special design in mind, which means that we have been given human dignity. We, we are made with a certain privilege, a certain honor, 
man that is, has that image of God that, that is to walk in the dignity in which we were created. Now, I said on Sunday that people use the B word loosely. B word so-and-so. Oh, that's a B. Well, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't speak to that person's dignity. That's, God didn't call them that. But people choose to call each other these words. But that doesn't honor the dignity of that person. Well, when well you say, well, that person, that's how they act. Well, that may be a sinful behavior of a person, but that is not their image. The image in a person is God. Now, in the upcoming weeks, we'll talk about how the image, uh, where, where, where man fell and how that affects the image. We talk about sin because sin does come into play here as we talk about the image, all right? So when God says image, tensel is the Hebrew word meaning to carve out or represent God, image. My image represents God. Wherever I walk in a place, I am representing God. God. I walked into several places, and before I could say anything, some people have said, you a preacher. Well, I didn't have on a name tag that said preacher. didn't have on a Mount Sinai shirt that says preacher. I just walked in, and people said, you must be a preacher. I walked into other places, and people have said, you, you, you must be a Christian. Didn't say I was a Christian, didn't talk about being saved, didn't say anything about the Bible. Well, what are they saying? That is saying that when I walk into a room or when you walk into a room, you are representing God, which means you are bearing his image. My brothers and sisters, that's a great compliment. I, that's a great compliment. And you heard me say before, Mount Sinai members, that when you go to your family reunion cookout, and your family members who are the drinkers, they put their alcohol bottle behind the chair when you come up. You know why they put that alcohol bottle up when you come up? Because you represent an image. You represent that image. And that image is of God. And that image, as we're going to see in a little bit, has a moral purity to it. So when you walk up, people begin in their, in their spirit become agitated because that purity is coming towards them, and they know that they're not being pure. Somebody calls you righteous. You, oh, that's a, you know they're going to, don't even ask them because they, you know they're going to do the right thing. That's a great compliment. Yay. If somebody thinks that you're going to always do the right thing, they don't approach you with gossip. They don't approach you with mess. They don't approach you with some uh, idea that's going to that's gonna be criminal. They know that you're not going to do it. Why? Why? Because you represent God. It's your image. You know? Every man and man who walks into their home, that when they come through the door, the image of God is coming through the door. That's why I always say every man, go home. Go to your house because when you come through the door, you are representing God in your house. And this is the standard that we will possess in our home or in this home. Demuth says, the other Hebrew word, likeness, to be like. So we represent God because we are like God. Now, that's important for us to understand and know because that's what makes me matter. I matter because I represent God. But, but in, in furtherance of that thought, it matters because I'm like God. My life matters. Well, somebody else's life matters as well. A white person's life matters. A Asian person's life matters. Black life matters. An adult life, a child life, an elderly life, a sick person, a mentally disordered person. All of these lives matter if they're in the same room. Nobody should be treated differently because of 
any stereotypes or any privileges. Everybody has the same privilege. Well, you get to eat first because you can walk to the table and somebody else doesn't have legs. Well, just because you can walk, does that give you the right to eat first? No. There's, uh, the person who doesn't have legs, they ought to be able to eat first too. Human dignity. Honoring people. All right? The image of God means two things in the scriptures. In verse 26, the reason why life matters is because God, God has given man dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dominion, rule. Man has that right. Where did it come from? It came from God. Man exists in relationship, male and female, which means man is able to make decisions. That's in the image of God. Because God has free will, he gave that to man. Now, when you push this concept a little further about life mattering, our being made in the image of God verifies that I am a human. It also bestows on me a special dignity that sets me apart because I'm made in God's image. That image is the image of Christ. Christ is the original pattern and image of God. Stay tuned now in a couple of weeks. We're going to get to that conformity to the image of Christ. Now, Black Lives Matter. In Scripture, when you look in Genesis, you want to talk about black life mattering. Why does it matter so much? His, from this biblical, historical perspective, when you go over to chapter 2, the first man, Adam, was not a white man. He was a man of color. Adam means reddish color. So he wasn't a white man. He had a he, he had color to him. Well, when you look in verse 13 of chapter 2, it says the name of the second river is Guyon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. Cush means black. Where was the Garden of Eden that God told man to cultivate? says in verse 10, now a river flowed out of Eden. Well, where was this land? Where was this Eden? A land of Cush. Cush means black. Black lives matter because historically, biblically, if you really want to get an understanding of black lives mattering, come back to the Bible. White people need to come back to the Bible and understand that origin starts in blackness, in color. So I, 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 the movement doesn't match up with the history and biblical theology. So you have to make sure that you understand that there is a difference from the movement to understanding the mattering. Okay, uh, that could be pushed a little bit, a little bit further, because as you turn all over into to your Bibles, we can begin to talk about even more. When we get to Genesis chapter 10, um, uh, Ham, and, and, and the, again, the origin of the black race. This is right here in, in the beginning book, the beginning pages of Scripture. My life matters because when God was creating life, he was creating men of color, people of color. Origin starts in Africa. Eden was in that in in the in 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 Africa. All right. So 
I, I, I want us to really understand that this is not about a movement. This is about where God is, all right? And not only just, like I said, not only does black need to understand that, white needs, all needs to understand that, all right? So when, so, so when God was creating man, verse number seven of chapter two says he formed man of the dust. So man now has this image that represents God. He has this likeness similar to God. So when God got ready for this image to have life, the text says in, in, in cha Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that God breathed, he blew his breath. The Elohim God, creator God, blew his breath into man, and man became a living being. So my life matters because I got my breath from God. So when David says in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath, he says, hey, when you take your breath, you celebrate being created in the image of God because that's where breath comes from. When a person breathes their last breath. That's it for them. God has taken that breath. He gave it. He took it away. Last breath, it, God is in control of that. So why does life matter? Life matters because God is in charge of it. All right? Now, uh, there's some other New Testament references here that I have on page number two that I'll, I'll come back to in the upcoming weeks. So let me sort of bring our Bible study this evening to a somewhat of a conclusion. Doesn't seem like I'm going to get through all of it, so I will I'll continue on in this subject uh, next week. But let me let me address this. Who is image who is in the image of God? The text lets us know in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that man and female is in the image of God. Our given sex is in God's image. Our sex, gender, is a distinction that God has given to us as a part of Elohim's design. God was so creative in his designing us to be like him that he says, I, I, I want to make them so that they can have relationship like I have relationship." Because remember, the verse says, let us make man. Well, who is the us? The Father, God, the Son, God, and the Holy Spirit, God. They had relationship one with another. So when God says, uh, when we create this man, he needs to be able to have relationship. So what will we do? We'll create a female, a male and a female, so that they can have relationships. I don't care what anybody says. A special relationship exists between a man and a woman. Now, when I see those who are of homosexual uh, relationships, you always see someone who is acting out the male uh, role. They all, you always see that. Somebody... Is even in, in, in the, if one is the man, one is the female, one is the husband, one is the wife. Even when there is two women or two men, that's not good theology. That's not good Bible. When it, this, when the sexes is is is, it, is to be distinguished. Life matters because of the distinction, male and female, politically. That somebody's political philosophy may not align up with this political philosophy. Well, you understand God created male and female. He created the distinctions so that there could be a, a, a relationship. I love hanging out with the boys. I, I, I love my male friends. I, I love talking. I love exerting that male uh, energy. I love the to stick out my chest and, and hang out with the boys. I, I love putting on my pants. I, I, I love 
tightening up my tie and putting on a suit. I love, I love being a male. But I love my wife. I, I love going home to her. I love that relationship with a female. I enjoy that. I enjoy my, my, my uh, female friends that are my sisters. That's why we say we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Those are relationships that God made us to have for us to enjoy. That is a part of our human dignity. All right? Um, turn with me to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And I'm going to conclude on page number three with this question. It says, when did God, when did God become involved in our lives? Turn to Psalm 139, verse 13 and 15. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 15. It says, for you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. When did God become involved in your life? He became involved in your life when he began to form you in your mother's womb. But do you know what? God was more involved in your life even before the forming in your mother's womb. God, when he was God before the heavens and earth, had already thought about you and who you would be, what your life would entail, what you would do, who you would marry, what church you would come involved in, who your family members would be. God had already thought about that. So my image, my likeness, in, in, in made in God's image, the pattern of life that is set before me, all that I need to do is trust God. Proverbs says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God, and he will direct your path. Why will he direct your path? Because he gave you life. He has already outlined your life. So what should I do then, Pastor? You should surrender to God, lift up your hands, and say, God, I trust you, and lead me to the truth that you desire for me. God created you wonderfully. Verse 14 says, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. What does your soul know? Your belief is what your soul is. Your soul houses your belief system. Where does my belief system originate from? It originates from scriptures. I get my anchoring of what I think and what I believe from scripture. Scripture lets me know and affirms what is true, what is not true. Well, who gave my, my soul life? God. So when I began to mirror my, the words in scripture that, to, to that what's breathed in me, that's when conviction kicks in, and that's what lets me know that that's God or that's not God. This is where I should go. This is where I shouldn't go. Why? Because I navigated in my soul and spirit by God, who is my creator, Elohim. Tonight, as we close out, what should you celebrate? Celebrate Elohim. Celebrate God. Celebrate who he is in your life. Why? Because that's what matters. Amen. I pray that you have uh, understood what I've been trying to share with you this evening about kingdom lives matter because a, a, a life that's a part of the kingdom of God is eventually going to see God one day. Those who have given their life to Jesus Christ will see God one day and be a part of his eternal kingdom. It is important that you and I give our life to Jesus Christ because we belong to his world. His world has a kingdom that he created through his son, Jesus Christ, that he wants us to be a part of. Yes, all men are made in the image of God, 
God desires that you all, that everyone enter into his kingdom, but you have to have accepted the conformity to the Son. All lies have not and will not conform and accept the Son. But in order to get into the kingdom, you got to accept the Son. That's what matters. God bless you. I look forward to dialoguing with you. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Have a wonderful evening.